Kim and Pastor Lynette. Aren't you glad that we have God's watchful care over us? Amen? Amen. Over these past several weeks, we have been following the book of Romans one chapter at a time. But today, we're going to be ambitious and cover three chapters. And the reason being that these three chapters are good to take collectively because the Apostle Paul deals with a topic that is different from really the rest of the book of Romans. Uh, the most of the book of Romans, at least much that we've been studying, chapters 5, 6, 7, and 8 are very practical. And now he gets into chapter 9 where he deals with a totally different question concerning the gospel as it relates particularly to the Jewish people. Some people have described these chapters as a parenthesis in the book of Romans, chapters 9, 10, and 11. Now that does not imply that they are of less importance, not at all, because a lot of times what's in parentheses can be very significant. Let me give you an example. If my mother were visiting and she were out in the foyer talking with some people and I was standing over here talking to you and I said to you, the woman standing over there, parentheses, the one with the blue shirt, end of parentheses, is my mother. Now you could take everything that's in the parentheses out of the sentence and it would still make perfect sense. The woman standing over there is my mother. But put the words in parentheses in the sentence and it adds detail and information that you wouldn't have otherwise. It would point out that it's specifically the person in the blue shirt, you see. And so what's in parentheses can be very, very important. It can add detail and clarification to what you're trying to say. In Romans, if you were to take chapters 8 and 12 and push them together and remove chapters 9, 10, and 11, the book of Romans would still make perfect sense. But Paul has included in chapters 9, 10, and 11 somewhat as a parenthesis, but again, to add detail, clarification, and information that we would not have otherwise. And the questions that he is seeking to answer here is how the gospel relates to the Jews. What, what's God going to do about the Jews? How does his promise connect with them, particularly in the wake of their rejection of Christ as the Messiah? Uh, as some people believe that Jews have been totally cut off. Others believe that all Jews will eventually be saved. And is that the answer, or does it lie somewhere in between? And so these are very difficult questions to look at. And, but the bottom line is that all people who are saved, ever have been saved or ever will be saved, will be saved because of the death of Jesus Christ on the cross and the grace that he offers and provides. And we're going to read the first five verses of the book of Romans chapter 9. And I think we have those on the screen. There we go. Verse 1, chapter 9 of Romans. Paul says, I tell you the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren. Now think about this statement. Paul is saying, I, I would just as soon be accursed or separated from Christ for my Jewish brothers. For he says, for my countrymen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises of whom are the fathers and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all the eternally blessed God. Amen. In chapters 9, 10, and 11, Paul is seeking to defend God's plan of salvation, which had been criticized by some Jews who rejected Jesus Christ as the Messiah. And the conclusion that Paul comes to is that the door of salvation is open for all people, both Jew and Gentile alike, through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, Gentiles are anyone who's not a Jew. And so the door of salvation is open to all people, through faith in what Christ has done for us on the cross. And there are two statements I want to make and build up on each one in this message this morning. We'll go ahead and put the first one up on the screen. And that is that God rejects us only when we have completely rejected Him. 
Because the question is, has God rejected the Jews because of what happened to Jesus Christ and their rejection of him as the Messiah and his crucifixion? As I mentioned, some people believe that Jews have been totally cut off from the possibility of salvation, which would go completely against what God teaches in his word about the door of salvation being open for all. And God cuts us off only when we have completely rejected them. What does that mean? Well, when we die, at that point, we have completely rejected Christ from our lives. But as long as we're alive, we have opportunity, whether Jew or Gentile, to be saved. Now, in verses 3 and 4, if you happen to have your Bibles open, in Romans chapter 9, listen to what Paul says about the Jewish people and the privileges that they had because they were God's chosen people. It says that they had the divine glory, they had the covenants, the receiving of the law, they had the promises of God, and then in verse 5 it says, theirs are the patriarchs, and from them, get this, from the Jewish people is traced the human ancestry of Christ. I mean, the Jewish people, as the chosen people of God, had all these privileges afforded them, and the opportunity to know God through his goodness. If you're familiar with British history much at all, in the 1800s, one of their foremost prime ministers was Benjamin Disraeli, and he also was a Jew. And one time, I'm sure many times, but one particular time, he was being taunted over the fact that he was a Jew. And he responded by saying, yes, my friend, I am a Jew. And I belong to the most wonderful nation on earth. Let me remind you that while your ancestors were gathering acorns in Germany, mine were giving the law to the world. You see, the Jewish people are and always have been very proud of their ancestry, and rightly so. I mean, they were given the oracles of God. They handed the law to the world. And you may have a heritage of which you are very proud. You may be very proud of your own ancestry. But the Jewish people kind of take it up a notch. And like I said, for good reason. But the irony of all of this is that in the process of it all, when Christ came, he was largely rejected by the Jewish people. And so despite the privileges they had of having the covenant and having the oracles of the law given to them, Still, they rejected Christ, by and large, when he came. In some ways, at least in this regard, there's a parallel here between the Jewish people and we Americans, in the sense that we too are blessed with great privileges as a country. In the sense that the gospel is available to us at our fingertips. Not only can we pick up a Bible any time of any day and read it because it's been printed and placed in our hands, but even beyond that, we have the opportunity to be open to biblical instruction literally 24 hours a day. If you have internet access, you have your choice of listening to any number of thousands of preachers any time you want to or to follow a Bible study online, or listen to an audio version of the Bible, if you'd like, in practically any version out there. You can listen to any Bible teacher you want, hear the sermons of practically any church in the country, because almost all of them record their sermons now. You can wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning unable to sleep, and you can listen to any preacher that you want to by going on the Internet. Even if you don't have online access, you can pop in a CD or a DVD, you can turn on the radio or watch on the television practically any time of the day and listen to the gospel message. We are a privileged people. And we have the gospel at our fingertips any second of any day. We have absolutely no excuse not to be informed and not to be taught or instructed in the word of God. But what irony it is then, in light of this, to see America waning in their spiritual fervor. And how we see more and more people rejecting Christ and many Christians not growing in their faith despite 
today in this moment, having more available to us than at any time in human history, the opportunity to hear and understand and learn and obey the Word of God. And while it's there, we often turn our backs on it and don't avail ourselves of the opportunity. It's really quite embarrassing. If you stop to think about it. All this privilege, all these opportunities right before us, and we often turn a deaf ear or a blind eye. Now, as Paul goes on in Romans chapter 9, he says something very interesting down in verses 30 and 30 through 33. In talking about faith and about salvation. After discussing this issue for a while, down in verse 30, he says, What shall we say then? That the Gentiles, who did not pursue righteousness, have obtained it. But notice what he says, a righteousness that is by faith. Then he says in verse 31, But Israel, who pursued a law of righteousness, has not obtained it. And then in verse 32 he says, Why not? Because they pursued it not by faith, but as if it were by works. Now this is very important. He says that even though the Jewish people were pursuing righteousness, he said they didn't receive it. Why not? Not because their heart wasn't good, not because they weren't wanting it, but because they were pursuing it by works. He said they weren't pursuing it by faith. They were pursuing it as if it were by works. Listen carefully. You could be pursuing righteousness, but doing so in all the wrong ways. That's what Paul's saying was Israel's issue. They were pursuing righteousness, but they were pursuing it by the law and not by faith. And you can pursue righteousness, and many people are, but they're doing it in all the wrong ways. A lot of people are trying to do it by works. They're trying to get there by their goodness. D.L. Moody once said that if anybody ever felt like they could earn the right to heaven, if everybody ever earned their way there, he said we'd never hear the end of it. Can you imagine all through eternity? Yeah, I worked my way here. <clears throat> you know, I earned my way. We'd never hear the end of it. It would be awful. When I was growing up in the 1970s, the television game show Family Feud came on. I remember that in about the mid-70s. and um, I, I always, in junior high and high school, I, I lived just a stone's throw from the junior high and then, then the high school, and so I always came home for lunch. And Family Feud came on at 11.30 with the Richard Dawson, you know, as the game show host and all that, and I would watch it practically every day while I ate lunch, you know. And the uh, interesting thing with this show, if, if you ever pay attention to this, 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 is, this is, it's amazing. You ever notice when they're going down with the family after they ask a question? It doesn't matter what answer one of the family members gives. It doesn't matter how stupid it is. The rest of the family will clap and say, good answer. It's the dumbest thing I've ever seen. I mean, it is ludicrous. The question could be, Name a beverage you eat with your breakfast. And the person could say, um, motor oil. And they go, good answer, good answer, good answer. I mean, it's bizarre. You wish one of them would just look at them and say, really? I mean, it's a ridiculous answer. There's like no chance of it being up on the board. It is sometimes embarrassing, the answers that they give. And they make absolutely no logical sense whatsoever. And yet the family will just clap and say, good answer, good answer, good answer, good answer. We live in a world, listen to me, where people will applaud and say good answer no matter what your answer is when it comes to how can I get to heaven. Well, I want to follow Buddha. Good answer, good answer. I want to follow Muhammad. Good answer, good answer. I'm going to try to keep the Ten Commandments. Good answer. I'm just going to try to be better than my neighbor. They're a bunch of slouches, and they're no good people anyway. I, oh, good answer. It's a good answer. Or I'm just going to be an honest person, a good person, and help the old ladies across the street and hold doors open for people. Oh, good answer. Good answer. And I'll get to heaven. And America just applauds whatever answer you give. Any answer is okay. 
As long as you're sincere about it, that's what America seems to think. Cindy and I were watching a, an old crime drama rerun the other day called Cold Case, and there was an individual in there who had a terminal disease and was soon going to be dying, most likely. And he was talking to this woman, and, and they got talking about heaven, because death didn't seem that far away from this man. And this woman mentioned heaven, and the guy said, no, I said, I think I'm going to be heading to the other neighborhood. And he's honest, you know, he's talking about hell, you know. You know what the woman said? She said, no, that place is only for people who have forgotten how to love. Well, doesn't that sound sweet? Something you might put on a Hallmark card. <laughs> hell is only for those people who have forgotten how to love. But see, that's what people believe. Nothing about Jesus, nothing about getting your sins forgiven, nothing about the cross, as long as you love people, as long as you care. And everybody says, good answer, that's a good answer. Maybe it'll be on the board. And there's not a chance in the world. And so we've come into a place now where any old answer will do. It doesn't matter if it's, if it's on the board. There's only one answer on the board, but everybody seems to think that no matter what answer you give, it's going to be up there. But Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through Him. There isn't a smorgasbord of answers. There's just one. Now, a lot of people, when you look at this statement, God rejects us only when we completely reject Him. There, there, there are some of you, and maybe, maybe you're here today, and you're thinking, I worry that maybe God's already rejected me. Maybe you're thinking, you know, I've done so many things wrong in my life, God's always going to reject me. How, how could He ever accept me after the things I've done or the way I turned my back on Him or the, the times I've shaken my fist in His face or after what I did last year or last month or ten years ago. And you're afraid that God's already rejected you. But God only rejects us when we completely reject Him. Ultimately reject What I mean by that is if you die in your sins, only then is your opportunity over. But if you're alive and you're breathing, you're here. You can hear this message and you can respond to the Spirit. God hasn't rejected you. You can come to Him today. He has not written you off. He hasn't looked at any living person and said, well, I'm going to put that person over here in that room because they're never going to get saved. I, I've written them off. They've done too many bad things in their lifetime. There's no way. God's never done that. You can be saved today. Doesn't matter how bad you've been. Doesn't matter what what replay the devil keeps throwing over into your brain of something in your past, it doesn't matter. God will forgive you. That's the good news of the gospel. Jesus said, he who comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. Never will. And so come to Jesus and he'll forgive you. God rejects us only when we have completely rejected him. The second thought I want to share on the screen today is that God redeems us when we receive his offer of salvation. That's Paul's message throughout the, the book of Romans, and particularly when we get to 9, 10, and 11, where he's talking about the Jewish people and the Gentiles, and he reminds us that the door is open to all of us by faith. Remember those famous verses that, that says that if we will confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, that you will be saved? You know that's in Romans 9, 10, and 11. Did you know that? It's in this parentheses section. It's in this part of Romans. Romans chapter 10, in fact. And, and so there it is, by faith, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. He didn't, he didn't put any nationality attached to it. didn't say you had to be Jewish, or he didn't say the Jewish people are excluded. Everybody's included. That we can be saved. Now, there are a couple of things we need to do, of course. One of them, this might be a surprise to you, you probably not expect me to say this, but I think it's important. First of all, you need to realize you're lost. You've got to realize you're lost. I think we sometimes overlook this step. I think it's important for us to realize that we're lost without Christ. And the reason I say that is, if, if you don't realize you're lost, you'll never seek to be found. If you don't know there's something wrong with you, you're never going to seek to get well. If you had cancer in your body, but you didn't know it, then you're not going to take any steps to get well, because you don't know it. It's not till the doctor says, well, the x-rays show this, then it's like, ah, oh, I need to do something about it, right? It's when you know, if you're out in the woods, and you don't know you're lost, you just keep walking and keep getting lost. You, know? you just keep getting a mess and further away from where you need to be. But you don't know it. And so you just keep wandering. And then you come to a point where it's like, I don't know how to get out of here. Well, now that you know it, 
you start to do what's necessary, take the proper steps to try to get found, right? It's not until you realize that you're lost that you start looking to get found. This is different than trying to tell people that they're sinners. I, I think, in, from my experience, I think most people know they're sinners. I just don't think most people think they're lost. I think there's a big difference. Because in my ministries, I've talked with people, I have never had anyone tell me they're not a sinner. Never. Nobody's ever said to me, well, I'm perfect. I don't need sins forgiven. Nobody's ever said that to me. I think everybody, generally everybody, I mean 99.9% .9 of the people in America will say, yeah, I'm a sinner. But most of them don't know they're lost. And that's the tragedy. That's the tragedy. They, they know they're sinners. They know they disobeyed God. They know they're not perfect. They say, do you know you're lost? No. Because they, fall, they follow these false notions of salvation. They're like, if I just do unto others as they do unto me, then I'll go to heaven. Or if I just am better than the average Joe, then I'll go to heaven. Or if I keep the Ten Commandments, or I go to church once in a while, or I don't tell lies, I'll go to heaven. And many people think that hell is just for murderers and child molesters. But hell is for anyone who has refused to accept Jesus Christ as Savior. There will be a lot of good moral people in hell. And so a lot of people just don't know they're lost. And so we need to understand that first, that we're lost. And the second thing we need to do is accept Christ as our Savior. And receive His salvation and forgiveness. To take in the living water, right? Jesus told the woman at the well that he had water. He'll never, he'll never thirst again if you drink it. It's the living water. And we just take it. It's all around us. I want to test your geography a little bit this morning. You know where the Amazon River is? What continent? South America. Okay, good. Nobody embarrasses themselves. Very good. South America. I remember learning in school that it was the second longest river in the world behind the Nile. But there are some other things I've learned since then that I find very interesting. The Amazon River in South America may be the second longest in the world, but what surprised me when I found this out is that the Amazon River, by volume of water, I mean sheer amount of water, is by far the greatest river in the world in terms of sheer amount of water. In fact, there is so much water in the Amazon River that it has more water than the Nile, the Mississippi, and the Yangtze rivers put together. Put together. And you might say, okay, cool, so what? I'm going somewhere with this, all right? <laughs> the Amazon River has a mouth that's about 90 miles wide. Bigger than some people I know. <laughs> and uh, none of you, of course. And this is part of what's fascinating. The flow of the Amazon River as it empties into the Atlantic Ocean is so great. Now listen carefully. The flow when it empties into the Atlantic Ocean is so great that its current can be detected 200 miles out into the Atlantic Ocean. 200 miles. Now here's why I'm telling you this. In ancient times, when all of this wasn't so well known, sometimes sailors would get caught in the doldrums, you know, where there's no wind, no current, and they're in this water. And sometimes locals would come along, maybe in larger ships or what have you, and they'd say, what's, what's the problem, you know? And they'd say, our sailors are dying of thirst. We need fresh water. And the locals would say, just dip your buckets in the water. Because you're sitting in the mouth of the Amazon. Now here's the thing. They might be so far out into the ocean, they can't even see land. And so you're thinking it's salt water, you can't drink it. But what they're actually doing is sitting in the outflow of the Amazon. And since fresh water is lighter than salt water, it rises to the surface. And so those who are caught in that dead zone can just dip their buckets in the water and it's fresh. Even though they're out where you would think it's just salt water. And so they would say, just dip your buckets. And here these people were dying of thirst, even though they were sitting in the midst of all 
this fresh water. And we live in a world where a lot of people are dying of thirst. And there's living water all around them. And all they have to do is just dip their hearts into that water and pull it up and Jesus Christ will forgive them of their sins and give them a thirst and they will never, or, or, or quench their thirst they will never ever thirst again it will satisfy all the longings of their heart and maybe that's you maybe you haven't taken Jesus into your life yet and you've maybe grown up in this great country where the gospel is preached and where living water is all around you but you've never accepted Jesus into your life and he wants to come into your heart Forgive your sins and write your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. The overarching message of Romans chapter 9, 10, 11 is that the gospel is for everyone. It's for Jew and Gentile alike. That God has not cut off anyone from the opportunity of salvation. And that we all are equally called to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So welcome Jesus into your life today. He loves you. He died for you. He wants nothing more than to be your Savior, to forgive your sins, and to write your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. Let's stand together.